Hi students, this is Professor Schimmel back with part two of bacterial diseases of the respiratory system. This could actually wind up being a three-part video, but I want to go ahead and start discussing with you some bacterial diseases of the lower respiratory system. Now I just want to remind you there is no normal flora of the lower respiratory system. Healthy individuals will have a sterile lower respiratory system. Okay, first example, and follow along on your outline, take notes, uh, would be the disease known as pertussis. It's also referred to as whooping cough, and it's caused by a bacterium named Bordetella pertussis. Happens to be gram-negative, uh, it's anaerobic, and it is a cocobacillus. Transmission, um, airborne, uh, inhalation of cough or sneeze produced droplets. Incubation is approximately 10 days, and we typically see this disease in infants less than a year of age and unimmunized infants. This is a very preventable disease, you guys. Now, the symptoms that will be presented initially would include a mild cough, sneezing, and an inflamed throat. Uh, now, over the next 10 to 14 days, the um, infection is going to um, make its way down into the lower symptom, uh, system and the symptoms are going to worsen. Now we're going to uh, see the typical severe cough that's associated with this disease. It's so severe that the patient has difficulty inhaling and they'll make a sound like <gasps> and that's what's referred to as the whooping cough. And if you've ever heard an infant uh, coughing and having difficulty breathing like this, I think maybe you'll uh, gain some perspective on the importance of uh, vaccinations and preventing this disease. The coughing at this point is so severe that vomiting is quite common, and it has been well documented that uh, usually this is in infants, the coughing may be so severe as to cause them to break ribs. And remember, this is a very young child. Now, these symptoms can persist for the next two to three weeks, uh, and they will um, typically taper off over that time. Uh, now, we may also experience some accumulation of fluid in the lungs and that can result in convulsions because the patient is obviously having some difficulties with gas exchange. Now the treatment uh, on the top of the list would be erythromycin, ampicillin is another good choice and if it's not a young patient tetracycline might be appropriate. Now recovery is going to provide the patient with what we call partial immunity. What that means is, is that they could become infected with the same organism at a later date. This subsequent infection uh, is likely going to result in milder symptoms. I don't know if you can take much comfort in that. And uh, again, let's try to prevent this instead of uh, allowing children to suffer through this. Immunizations begin at two months of age. And once again, it's our DPT vaccine uh, that would be used. All right, let's go ahead and move on to a discussion of tuberculosis. Now, this is a very complicated uh, disease, highly infectious, caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is a gram-positive bacillus, and it is also acid fast. You guys, I think, will remember staining Mycobacterium smegmatis using the acid fast staining technique in lab. That is the same technique that would be used in a diagnostic microbiology laboratory to help um, uh, diagnose this condition. All right, so there are, um, and you've got some stats in front of you um, in your outline, uh, approximately 22,000 new cases of tuberculosis a year in the United States. Uh, and it's estimated that somewhere between 10 to 15 million Americans are infected with mycobacterium. And the majority of these cases, though, are um, dormant, inactive cases, uh, but they do uh, present the, um, uh, with the potential to become active at a later date. Typically, we refer to these cases as being latent. Now, uh, tuberculosis is second only to HIV and AIDS as being the single uh, greatest single infectious agent uh, killer worldwide. In uh, 2011, 8.7 million people worldwide fell ill with tuberculosis and there were 1.4 million deaths. Uh, I'll let you go ahead and read through the rest of those stats on your own uh, because you do have that information in your outline.
All right, let's go ahead and talk about transmission of the disease. 75% of tuberculosis cases are acquired through the respiratory route. Now, I do wanna just briefly point out that you can become infected with tuberculosis in some other ways. Uh, for example, through ingestion of contaminated milk uh, or by direct contact. So tuberculosis, um, mycobacterium tuberculosis can cause infections in other body sites, respiratory system, GI tract, uh, bone and joint infections, for example, but we're going to concentrate on the, um, the respiratory or pulmonary infection. So as I said, 75% of TB cases are acquired through the respiratory route, a highly contagious organism. Incubation, it's variable, highly variable from one patient to another, so I'm not going to um, give you a range for this one. And this is a disease that traditionally has been associated with um, poverty and overcrowding, poor hygiene. Now it's very commonly seen in um, HIV and AIDS patients. So uh, it's, it's becoming um, an increasing problem in that population. Latent infections may remain in that state for years or even decades and become reactivated at some later date. Uh, the only um, evidence of a latent infection could be uh, obtained through tuberculosis skin testing. Uh, and that involves the use of what's called PPD, or purified protein derivative. This is actually a filtrate from mycobacterium that has been grown in, um, in a liquid media. And this PPD is going to be injected under the um, upper layers of the skin. Patient comes back. Uh, 48 to 72 hours later to have that, um, that injection site uh, examined by a healthcare practitioner. And if there is swelling and redness at the site, we consider that to be a positive skin test. I'll talk more about that in a little while. But uh, back to the idea of latent cases being difficult to identify, uh, a skin test would be one way to identify those latent cases. Now, it's um, generally going to take somewhere between 2 to 12 weeks for a patient either to show some symptoms to tuberculosis or to convert to a positive reaction to that uh, tuberculosis skin test using PPD. All right, let's talk about the symptoms and the progression of the disease. First of all, let's talk about the primary infection. So the bacterium is inhaled and it's going to be engulfed by macrophages um, in the lungs. And something that is especially frightening about this process is usually macrophages will digest uh, the invaders. But in this case, mycobacterium has evolved to be able to, um, most of the time, actually survive inside of the macrophages and multiply there. And macrophages travel all over our body, so that means that the infection could show up at other body sites. All right, uh, the patient at this point may be asymptomatic or they may be experiencing some mild flu-like symptoms. Uh, and by two to six weeks uh, after the initial infection occurs, the um, infection has become uh, systemic and the patient is going to uh, develop a hypersensitive response, that means an allergic response, to the infection. Now, nodules called tubercles, tubercles are going to form in the lungs, and those represent sites of active multiplication of mycobacterium. If the patient was healthy um, prior to this infection, the primary infection is usually handled quite well. Uh, some weeks in, the bacteria will stop multiplying in these tubercles, and over a period of months to years, they will calcify. Uh, it's essentially the body is forming a wall around the offender to protect itself, to separate itself from the bacterium. And these tubercles are going to be what show up on chest x-rays at a later date. All right, now at this point, the patient is either going to be um, latent, become latent, um, or they may progress into uh, development of some active symptoms. All right, now um, let's go ahead and move on to a discussion of what's called reactivation, or sometimes it's referred to as adult tuberculosis. Reactivation most frequently occurs in men, 
over 50 years of age, and it's associated with um, uh, alcoholism and malnutrition, and diabetics are going to be uh, at a higher risk of um, a latent case converting to an active case. Usually reactivation occurs in the lungs, it can occur in other parts of the body, uh, but most typically in the lungs, and the reactivated cases are going to be quite aggressive. As the bacterium uh, literally breaks open the tubercles and continues to multiply, it is going to um, cause necrosis of the lung tissue. Some of the symptoms that we will see during reactivation include um, a chronic blood-tinged cough. I think that's probably one of the uh, more classic tuberculosis symptoms. Uh, weight loss, night sweats, and a chronic fever. The, uh, the old-fashioned name for this disease was um, consumption because the patient would uh, waste away through weight loss and uh, damage to their lungs from the severe coughing. All right, now um, let's talk about screening for the disease. There is a progression uh, that would be involved in screening for TB. Now, the first level of screening would involve the skin testing that I, I talked about a few minutes ago. Um, inject the patient with PPD, come back 48 to 72 hours later, look for swelling and redness. Now, if a patient has a positive reaction to a skin test, it means one of, I guess, three things. One, it could mean either that they'd been exposed, but they didn't actually become infected, but they did develop antibodies to mycobacterium. Or it could mean that they were um, exposed and they have a latent case, um, or it could mean that they have an active case of tuberculosis, um, or, and I thought of a fourth possibility, it could also mean, a positive skin test could also mean that that individual was vaccinated against tuberculosis. Vaccination of the population for TB is common in parts of the world really other than the United States, for example, Europe and Asia, and this is an effort to prevent childhood cases of tuberculosis. Uh, one of the main reasons that we don't vaccinate the general population here in the U.S. is that uh, once you are vaccinated, you will give a positive reaction to a skin test for a minimum of four years and possibly for your entire life. And so if we vaccinated our population, then skin testing would not be a useful screening tool. And it is relatively inexpensive and, um, let's say, uh, less invasive than having to go through a chest x-ray or um, have a sputum sample obtained from the patient. All right, so skin testing, that would be the first level of screening. Now, if a patient has a positive reaction to a skin test, then what we're going to do next is a chest x-ray and we're looking for those calcified nodules. If we do find those, then we've narrowed the possibilities down to either a latent case or an active case. Uh, if we find ourselves in this position, then we will need to obtain a sputum sample from the patient and an acid fast stain would be done on that sample just like we did in lab. If that acid fast stain comes out positive, then we have an active case of tuberculosis. All right, now treatment. Here's where it gets really sticky, you guys. Uh, because this organism is so highly drug resistant, the patient is going to be treated with two or possibly even three antibiotics simultaneously. Uh, we call this um, synergism, right? The, uh, the action of these drugs working together is more effective than if they were used singly. And treatment may take anywhere from six to nine months or as long as two years. Here's the problem. First of all, the medications themselves don't make the patient feel very well. They're, they're pretty hardcore drugs. And secondly, we can't afford to, nor would we really want to, institutionalize infected individuals for this period of time. I mean, it isn't practical um, economically and for many other reasons. And so we uh, will provide counseling and support to the patient and uh, hopefully very clear instructions and uh, trust that they will go home and they will take their medications as required. Patients are always compliant. And this is one of the things that is uh, um, increasing the uh, issue with drug resistance. Now think about if you had to take those medications for two years, uh, how compliant do you think that you would be? This is definitely a problem. Now as far as uh, drugs go to treat this infection, you've got some notes.
in your outline, uh, top of the list would be isoniazid. Uh, rifampicin is another. Ethambutol uh, may be used. And then typically two or of those drugs that I just mentioned will be combined with another drug, um, for example, streptomycin. And actually the treatment of tuberculosis is rather a personal thing. Uh, this would be, would be a situation where the bacterium would be tested for its susceptibility uh, to various antibiotics and then a cocktail specific to that infection is going to be prescribed to be most effective for that patient. Now, uh, as we see an increase in drug resistance uh, in tuberculosis, we are seeing uh, uh, very resistant strains uh, showing up in different parts of the world. Uh, for example, uh, what we refer to as multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, that's defined as strains of TB, of mycobacterium tuberculosis, that don't respond to at least the uh, traditional frontline or first-line treatment, isoniazid, uh, rifampicin, ethambutol, and what we refer to as being extensively uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis is resistant to both the uh, first line of treatment and the second line of treatment. Uh, I, and, and we're seeing both of those situations show up in pretty much every part of the world that you can imagine. I would also guess that it isn't going to be long before we see strains that don't respond to any, uh, any of the uh, drugs that we have in our arsenal. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and break for here, and then uh, we will pick up part three shortly. Thanks for listening.